Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation with New York Senator and 2020 contender Kirsten Gillibrand. Uh, I want to ask you now about immigration. Uh, Buffalo, New York, in your home state, uh, was one of the locations that Customs and Border Patrol officials had said they were looking at as a place to move some of these migrants who'd been captured at the border into detention facilities uh, in your home state. What have you actually been informed of uh, that may be under consideration and may be happening? I've been informed of absolutely nothing by this administration. And the truth is, President Trump's immigration policy is inhumane, ineffective, and wrong. Uh, I cannot tell you how infuriating it is for our president to still be separating children from their parents at our border in the most inhumane way and then locking them up and paying for it, paying for-profit prison systems to do this. As president of the United States, I would not fund any for-profit prisons. I would not lock up these families. I would have a humane immigration policy where people seeking asylum and people seeking refuge in this country would have lawyers and have a proper asylum process. We need real immigration judges, which we don't have, uh, that are appointed for life and outside the political process. I think what President Trump's done on immigration is divisive and hurtful and harmful to our national security. Do you then uh, support something like Senator Graham uh, has proposed, which would, you mentioned family separation, to stop uh, what the administration has used uh, as a justification for that. They have said, look, legally, we're restricted to only keeping people in detention together for 20 days. You can't move I them through the process I wouldn't keep them in detention fast. at all. But you oppose even what the Obama administration did in terms of keeping families together or keeping them together for a longer period of time in detention? I, I wouldn't, as president of the United States, I wouldn't use the detention system at all. In fact, what I would do is actually fund the border security measures that are anti-terrorism, anti-human trafficking, anti-drug trafficking, uh, and anti-gun trafficking. And I would defund these for-profit prison systems that are harming children and harming families who are seeking our asylum. But if so, someone it, so is seeking asylum, I would assign them a lawyer. Homeland Security, though, saying hundreds of thousands of people are, are crossing the border and they need to go somewhere before their asylum claims are actually heard, what would you do with them? They don't need to be incarcerated. They can, if they're given a lawyer and given a process, they will follow it. They can go into the community in the way we used to handle these cases under the Department of Justice. Should the Trump administration get some of the $4.5 billion they say they need to improve humanitarian conditions? We can work with the Trump administration on two things. We can work with them on funding anti-terrorism and border protection when it comes to human and drug trafficking and gun trafficking. We can work with them on resources for more humanitarian treatment, uh, for medical treatment, for um, support for humane um, processes. But I do not believe we should be funding for-profit prison systems in any circumstance. So you would oppose moving any migrants to the state of New York? What the state of New York does well is we, te we t actually take refugee families into our communities. We would be delighted to take refugee families into cities like Buffalo and Syracuse and Rochester and Albany. Your campaign um, has yet to reach the 65,000 uh, individual donors that you would need to qualify to uh, be on that first debate stage. Um, why do you think that is? Is, is the large number of candidates uh, hurting campaigns like yours? Well, all I would say to your viewers is if you like anything that I've talked about today, go to KirstenGillibrand.com and support my campaign. Uh, this is a marathon and not a sprint, and we are building support all across the country in all 50 states, and I hope your viewers will join our efforts. But is the fact that we have nearly two dozen candidates hurting the Democratic bid here? I don't think so. I think primaries are so healthy for our party. It allows candidates to talk about their vision for America. My vision is to make sure we deal with the real problems this country is facing. So you think you will make it to that debate stage? I do, especially with the support of your viewers. Senator, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was not a show endorsement, but that was a pitch from the senator. Uh, we'll have uh, to welcome to the program now our political analysis. Peter Baker is the chief White House correspondent at The New York Times, and an expanded version of his book, Obama, The Call of History, has just been released. 
Kristen Saltis Anderson is joining us for the first time. She's a Republican pollster and a columnist with the Washington Examiner. Edward Wong is a diplomatic and international correspondent at the New York Times. And Jamel Bowie is a columnist with the New York Times and also a CBS News political analyst. Uh, let's pick up where we just left off with the senator, uh, Jamel. The senator Gillibrand says it is not hurting the Democratic bids, the fact that they have nearly two dozen or two dozen <laughs> candidates. I guess we are totally at 24 at now. Uh, I mean, is she being kind there? Is it hurting campaigns like hers? I think it may be just because there's only the pool of voters is only so big and there are so many choices that maybe in the absence of five or ten of these candidates, there may have been more possible support for Senator Gillibrand. But now that there are so many, it's harder for her to get traction. Uh, but as, in terms of kind of the Democratic Party as a whole and sort of it trying to figure out its direction over the next year, I think that this large primary is probably a good thing. It's good for Democrats in, in 2016, for Republicans for that matter, to hash out their differences, hash out these issues and try to figure out who might be best equipped to run in a general election. Well, Peter, You've covered many presidencies, many campaigns. Uh, we saw the vice president, former vice president Joe Biden, at rallies yesterday talking about how he planned to challenge the president and his strong economic message. Yeah. And that's basically to say, well, you should thank Obama. Yeah, yeah. Well, look. Does that work? I mean, to some extent, obviously. He's focused on Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. He's focused on those states that the Democrats shouldn't have lost but by, you know, traditional uh, history. Uh, and trying to hit them with the economic message because they're, otherwise Trump is going to be uh, selling the idea that he has made America great again through the economy. And, and Biden's got to undercut that if he can. But it's a tough sell because, uh, you know, at a certain point, three, four years into a presidency, you, you start saying it has to be, you know, the current guy, not just the previous guy. And, and, and uh, uh, Biden's going to try to make the case that uh, he can do something that other Democrats can't, which is to take on Trump directly uh, in a very, you know, head on head kind of way. Kristen, you heard from the president this morning on Twitter, as we often do early on Sundays, uh, basically saying that he's not getting credit for the great economy. Is that still the central issue, or is, are some of these more culture war issues, abortion, immigration, going to be what helps him uh, in this re-election bid? Well, there's no doubt that the economy is the issue where the president pulls the most strongly. When you ask, who do you trust, or do you trust the president on certain issues, uh, the economy tends to be the one where he has the clear sort of majority saying, yes, we think he's at least doing a good job on that. But it doesn't necessarily have as much emotional resonance. And while the convention Conventional wisdom is that people vote with their pocketbooks, that if they like the way things are going, they'll want to continue four more years. What we've really seen is that with the economy getting so much better, it's actually fallen in the list of sort of people's top issues. Now you tend to see issues like health care and immigration. Um, and so I actually think perhaps less so than some of the really hot button issues like abortion, I do believe health care is going to be one of the issues that really helps decide 2020. Because even as people are feeling sort of better about the economy, unemployment is lower, if it still costs a lot for them to get health care, and it still seems as though Republicans uh, do not have an answer for that, uh, that's going to be a challenge facing the president in 2020. On the issue of abortion, the president wants to have this argument. He's been tweeting about it. And as you just heard, one Democratic candidate thinks this is also something uh, that should be talked about on the campaign trail. It, it, what is behind this right now as we look at the state level at these tightened restrictions? Is it all just a cynical bet that this becomes something that the Supreme Court ultimately gets to and that this resonates for the president and some of his evangelical supporters? Well, something else that the president has tweeted out within the last couple of hours is my read was sort of pushing back on the Alabama bill, which sort of had no uh, exceptions for things like rape, incest, et cetera, by sort of saying, look, that's not where I am. I'm where Ronald Reagan was. Really, uh, I think, correctly assessing that the Alabama law, by taking a position really only held by 15 percent of Americans, was creating a wedge within the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big shift. I mean, after the passage of laws in uh, New York and Virginia earlier this year, there had been a sense that there was momentum swinging toward the pro-life side, that the pro-choice side had gone too far. This really sends the pendulum back the other direction, and I think that's why you saw the president with that tweet kind of distancing himself um, from what happened in Alabama. But, Ed, even in foreign policy, uh, this question of abortion is something that has been implemented, at least on that level, the president can tighten in terms of foreign aid, uh, how that's used abroad with this so-called Mexico City policy. Um, 
it's not just a theoretical debate at this point. It's not just a state level. It is something that the administration is putting its shoulder behind. Right. We saw um, Pompeo announce earlier this spring that they would um, cut off funding to any organization, foreign organization that sort of promoted uh, policies that might be involved, uh, that might involve abortion. And I think that uh, the administration is trying to shore up the ev evangelical voter base as well as other um, supporters that believe strongly in these policies through its foreign policy. And Pompeo has been very active on that front. I think just to, to pick up on the, the domestic politics of this, it's very clear that President Trump believes that his reelection will depend on kind of massive mm -hmm. base mobilization. But what's interesting about this push to restrict abortion is that part of his appeal in 2016 was that he was somewhat heterodox on social issues. He didn't appear to be kind of a traditional conservative Republican. And so taking this approach may end up, you know, if, you, if you think like a little dialectically about it, may end up uh, creating the kind of backlash among some of his own voters that may end up damaging him in 2020. Among those uh, non-college working class whites who aren't as socially conservative as, uh, as white evangelicals mm -hmm. uh, but supported Trump nonetheless. But I want to ask you uh, the same question I put to Senator Gillibrand which was is there room in the Democratic Party for people who morally object to abortion? I think there's certainly room within the Democratic Party for um, voters who are have conservative views on abortion. If you look at, for example, Latino and African American voters who tend to have more conservative views on abortion at, attached to the sort of higher religious attendance, they're clearly voting for Democrats. It's just not, if you are a voter whose principal kind of political issue, what's most salient for you is abortion, then there probably isn't very much room in the Democratic Party for you if you are an anti-abortion pro-life voter. But if you are someone who maybe has those views, but it's less it's mm -hmm. lower on the list of salient issues, then there's plenty of space for you. I want to take a break and come back, talk about some of the other issues of the week, including the threat posed by Iran in a moment. Stay with us. And we're back now with our panel. Uh, there is so much to digest um, from this week and even just from the show on immigration, on Iran. Ed, Edward Wong, I want to go to you on the threat. Um, Adam Schiff, who is one of the very few Congress people actually briefed on the intelligence the administration acted on regarding Iran, didn't dispute what he was told. He criticized policymaking. What do we actually know about the threat posed by Iran that led to this military response by the Trump administration? Uh, I think that officials picked up on several intelligence strands that were coming through. Um, right around the time of May 3rd. Um, one was that there were missiles being loaded onto small wooden boats in the Persian Gulf um, by Iranian forces. Another was that there was some chatter that um, among militia groups in Iraq that they might try and attack American bases or facilities, the embassy in Baghdad, possibly the consulate in Erbil. Um, and so the I think the, uh, some officials who picked up on this said that they wanted uh, some sort of deterrent against Iran. They wanted messaging, signaling to send to Iran to deter them from doing this. Now, the question is whether someone like Bolton and possibly Pompeo took that and decided to um, push forward in a way that made Pentagon officials and others uncomfortable, sort of like putting um, them in a position of sort of ramping up deployment forces, um, coming up with plan, military plans that made other officials uncomfortable. Because intelligence and Pentagon officials have always been pushing, have been pushing back this spring against certain um, policies like the designation of the uh, Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization. They've been pushing back against this, saying these policies will put troops and um, officers in danger. And then the administration went ahead and did that. And so when you see reports, as we saw in The New York Times, of 120,000 troops being reviewed, it sounds like, reading between the lines, you're suggesting that was leaked to kill that response? I'm not sure. Um, I uh, can't say who the sources were. but. There's, uh, you know, there's various motivations for people giving out that kind of information. Might be, some people interpret it as um, giving it out so that there can be a public debate on it, that there hasn't been a public debate on what to do with troop deployments or planning. And I think that people are aware of very much of what happened in 2002, 2003 in the run-up to the Iraq war and that they think that there should be a public conversation over this. Peter, I mean, you wrote this book about the Obama administration um, and the call of history. This was such a landmark portion of the former president's mm -hmm. foreign policy, right. cooling and controlling this one part of the threat posed by them, the nuclear program. 
Is this like the key question um, for all the Democrats running right now? Do you rejoin this deal? Mm -hmm. Is it possible? And, and how do you do that in a way that doesn't just look like it's trying to revive the Obama legacy? Yeah, no, it's a great question because, in fact, as you're right, it is one of the big foreign policy legacies he left behind. The first thing, one of the first things that President Trump decided to undo. I think most Democrats out there running have said or will say, likely to say, that they would get back into it in some form or another. Whether or not um, you actually can. Whether you can or not. And the Iranians are clearly banking on that. I mean, the reason why they have been restrained for the most part over the last year, they've not rushed toward back toward a nuclear program, at least according to reports that we've seen, is because they seem to be wait, wanting to wait out Trump to see if they can't uh, get a new president come in in 2021 that they can uh, uh, do another deal with. Um, but it's really interesting because this is where Obama, you know, this whole question of the last week of so of, of a confrontation with Iran gets at where Obama and Trump were, at least in theory, more alike, mm -hmm. which is in very different ways. Trump is more bombastic and, Trump, and, and Obama is more intellectualized. But they both talked about, you know, we're tired of these endless wars, right? President Trump came to office on the idea of pulling out of this Middle East kind of quagmire rather than getting further in. And he's now surrounded by people like John Bolton and Mike Pompeo who are egging him on the other direction or saying, look, this is a big threat. You need to be more assertive. Mm -hmm. And it's a real test for this president at this point uh, where he plans to go. Well, it's something uh, you point out those similarities. I think it's going to be fascinating to finally watch a foreign policy debate with the Democratic uh, candidates to hear how they'll differentiate themselves. Thanks to all of you. And we'll be right back in a moment. We're joined now by author David Marinus. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who's perhaps best known for his biographies of Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. But his latest book, A Good American Family, tells the story of his father, Elliot Marinus, and how the Red Scare of the 1940s and 1950s changed his life. Good to have you here. Thank you, Margaret. So The Good American Family is actually your American family. Yes, the title comes from a member of the House Un-American Activities Committee who in 1951 gave a speech and said that he was shocked that anyone from a quote unquote good American family could be affiliated at any time with the Communist Party. And the whole book is a point of showing that our family was a good American family, even though my father and my mother at one point were members of the U.S. Communist Party. Well, you write in the book um, about this idea of un-American. You talk about the hearings before Congress. Yes. What was that like for your father, going through that kind of questioning? Did you ever really sit and talk to him about that? You know, my dad really didn't want to talk about it by the time I was, I was two years old when this happened. And 63 years later, as I was starting to research this book, um, because before that, you know, I'd written all these biographies of strangers to me, like Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and Vince Lombardi, who became familiar to me by the time I was done. Mm -hmm. This time I was starting with someone who I thought was intimately, I was intimately familiar with. I was worried would he be a stranger by the time I was done, because I didn't really know this part of our family's past. I was at the National Archives, and I found there the statement that my father wanted to read to the committee at the hearing, and he was not allowed to unless he confessed and named names, which he would not do. And it was in that statement um, that he never got the chance to read but had yes. prepared that he said, I would rather have my children miss a meal or two now than have them grow up in the gruesome, fear-ridden future for America projected by the members of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. My Americanism has been questioned, and to properly measure a man's Americanism, you must know the whole pattern of a life. It was a very powerful statement, and it was the statement of, a, of an American citizen, of a man who had been the commander of an all-black unit in World War II in the Pacific, being called un-American by a chairman of the committee who had, in his earlier life, been a member of the Ku Klux Klan briefly. And so that juxtaposition of what does it really mean to be an American um, is as relevant today as it was in the 1950s. You know, I don't write about today in the book, but the echoes are there throughout. What, what specifically the echoes? I mean, these days you hear the term socialism thrown about, and it doesn't necessarily have the same resonance, clearly, as during this heated moment in time, but it still has a stigma attached to it. Well, it has a stigma attached to it by people who wanted to have a stigma attached to it. You, you can talk to uh, people 35 and under, and it's a completely different definition and feeling about socialism. Um, but 
I would say that the, the stronger echoes are not about socialism, but about the use of fear um, as a manipulative tool in the political process, which is what Joseph McCarthy, the senator, used during the 1950s and which the president is using today, demonizing others, um, stretching the truth and facts in an, in an effort only for political purposes. Did you feel like you were writing a commentary on today? You're drawing these, these parallels. Yeah. But, but this was a different uh, time. The threat felt immediate. There yes. was a, a, something to be blamed. Um, and right now what you're talking about is, is kind of an argument amongst ourselves. In some ways, oh, of course they're different. I mean, history doesn't repeat itself. You know, there, there are echoes in, in, of it, but it's not the exact same thing ever. And as a matter of fact, it's upside down now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, here you have the president um, using the term McCarthyism and calling the attacks on him a witch hunt. In writing this, was this sort of therapeutic for you? That's a great question. You know, I, I, I didn't think it would be, but it was. Um, it really helped me understand myself, my family, and my country. You know, all of us hear these stories about our own family. Um, you know, they're, they're part myth and part true, and we never go back and explore them. I had done that with strangers, but to do it um, with my own family really helped me understand so much about myself. So in that sense, it was therapeutic. Did your father, towards the end of his life, have, have anger about this, or did he feel, um, you know, his worldview evolved or it changed? Did he ever say, I'm no longer, you know, subscribing to this worldview represented by communism? I made a mistake here. He never said I made a mistake here, but he did say at one point that he was stubborn in his ignorance in his earlier life. That's about it. But, but it was never a matter of, uh, of repentance because the, he, he evolved, but he never became bitter. He never wanted to destroy this country. He just wanted to make it better. What made you follow in his footsteps and become a journalist? I was too stupid to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I loved writing from a very early age. And my father certainly didn't discourage that. It's in, it's in my blood. My mother was a book editor. My grandfather was a printer. My dad was a newspaper man. So I followed into that. All right. David Marinus, thank you very much for thank sharing you, your Margaret. story and that of your family. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching, and we want to wish a very happy birthday to our executive producer, Mary Hager. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.